Acts chapter 2, I'm going to go ahead and dive in because it's 11 o'clock and I'm hungry. I'm preaching hungry this morning. Last Sunday, we began a new series called World Changers. Why don't you say World Changers? World Changers. We taught out of Acts chapter 8 about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and we talked about the one, the one, how most times the world has changed, not one group at a time, not one big event at a time, but by one person at a time. And today I want to continue with this series, part two, entitled That Church. Why don't you say that church? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say that church. Amen. Now turn to the person who is your second option and say that church. Amen. That church. Acts chapter two, we're going to begin with verse 41. We're going to read through verse 47. To give you a little bit of background, Jesus Christ has ascended to heaven. He now sits at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us his saints and the promised Holy Spirit has been poured out on the early church and it has gotten the attention of the onlookers. How many of you know when the Holy Spirit of God is poured out upon a person's life upon or upon a church, there is a visible, tangible difference in that person and in that church. I don't know about you, but I want to be the type of church where heaven has reached down and kissed and the Holy Spirit has been poured out to the point where all the onlookers in Washita Parish can't help but to take notice because there's something different about that person. There's something different about their family. I don't know what's going on at the Assembly West Monroe, but something's different about that place. And the something's different is because the Spirit of the living God has been poured out. And that's what's taking place here in Acts 2, where the Spirit of God has been poured out. Peter, he steps up and preaches such a powerfully convicting message that the people can't, their only response is, what must we do to be saved? You see, that's what happens when the unadulterated, unaltered, unedited word of God is preached with passion and boldness from a pulpit. People can't help but say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter preached such a powerful message. The Bible says that they were pierced at the heart. How many of you know we need some piercing preaching? We need some preaching that will pierce the hearts of the most hardened people in Washita Parish because the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is this parish's only hope. And Peter, he steps up and he preaches such a powerful message. The response is, what must we do to be saved? Peter explains to them that they must repent of their sins, put their faith in God, and be baptized, and that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's pick up in Acts chapter 2 beginning with verse 41. It says, Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. How, how would you like to follow up with 3,000 people after a service? Check out all the guest cards. There's 3,000 people saved at the assembly this morning. There's a lot of follow-up there. 3,000 people. Verse 42 says, All. I want you to say All. All the believers, listen, this is important later, devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. Verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all. Say awe. awe. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all, say awe. All the believers met together in one place. Now, that's what we're doing this morning. We're meeting together today because they met together back then as well in one place, all together. He said they shared everything they had. They sold their property. They sold their possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. And they met together in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. How about a big amen to God's word? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. We ask you to speak to us now these next few minutes about that church. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said 
Say that church. That church. We're talking about world changers. How many of you know, how many of you would like to be a part of that church? The, the church that we read about in Acts chapter 2. See, I believe that we can be. I believe what God did in the book of Acts chapter 2, God can still do on Blanchard Street in the year 2019 amongst all the believers at the assembly. Because God hasn't changed. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. The same God that poured out the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2 in the early church in Jerusalem is the same God that will pour out His Spirit upon the assembly, West Monroe, if we come hungry enough. See, I want to be that church. I want to share with you three characteristics out of the passage we just read about becoming that church. Three things. Number one, they believed. Two, they belonged. And three, they became. Number one, write this down if, you have, or if you're taking notes. Number one is they believed. They believed. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we just read. It says, those who believed. What Peter said were baptized and they were added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Those who believed. What was it that those early people, the early church people, what is it that they believed? Well, I can tell you what they didn't believe. They didn't believe a, a message that was void of dealing with sin. They didn't believe a message that was void of, of dealing with conviction or repentance or new life. They didn't believe a message that talked about four ways to God. They didn't believe a self-help message. They didn't believe an edited, altered gospel. They believed the pure preaching of the Word of God. And as a result of that, their lives were radically changed. They were regenerated as a result of the pure preaching of the Word of God that came through the lips of the Apostle Peter. They believed. They believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They believed that he was the promised Messiah that the prophets prophesied, prophesied about hundreds of years ago. They believed that he lived a perfect, sinless life. They believed that he was the Lamb of God that was crucified since the foundations of the earth for the sinfulness of humanity. They believed that he was buried in a tomb and three days later he was raised victoriously and now sits at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for his saints. This message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ it pierced their hearts they repented of their sins and they believed by putting their faith in the only one that could save them from their sins these weren't people that were worked up emotionally they weren't given in by hype they didn't pray a little repeat after me one two three type prayer just to keep them out of hell these were people that the Spirit of God convicted of their sins and they repented of their sins and turned and put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Messiah. What are the effects of what they believe? When they believed, their lives were radically changed and transformed. They were regenerated. There was literally new life that was placed in them. They experienced a new birth. And as a result, their lives were radically transformed. You see, that's what, happen that's what happens when we truly believe. When the Spirit of God, through the preaching of, the preaching of His Word, convicts our hearts of our sins, we realize that we're sinners in need of a Savior. We're willing to repent of our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ when that truly happens and when we truly believe our lives are radically transformed and we don't think the way we used to think we don't act the way we used to act we don't walk the way we used to walk we don't live the way we used to live why because our lives have been radically changed by the gospel in which we believe don't tell me that you believe and get up here today and continue to do the very same things that you've done five or ten years ago when we believe, God comes in and he changes our affections. And yes, although our sin nature continues to crave things that the spirit, uh, the spirit is against, the Spirit of God gives us the power to crucify our sinful nature and to die daily when we believe. When we believe. When we believe or what we believe will be tested. These believers believed but when they believed and when they were transformed and, and when they were baptized in that day, they were giving their allegiance to another king. And 
As a result of them giving their allegiance to another king, their lives were in jeopardy. They faced persecution. Some of them lost their lives. Some of them lost their homes. Look, you and I at some point are going to be tested by what we believe. If we say we believe it, then I can assure you sooner or later, it may be this week, next month, or next year, life is going to be life. Life's going to happen. The enemy is going to come at us, and we are going to be tested to see whether we really believe what we believe. But these are people that believed. 3,000. You think about that army that God raised up that day. 3,000 people believed and were added to the church that day. 3,000 people's lives were changed. 3,000 people, as we sang about, their souls were saved. Their eternity was, was altered. Their destiny was changed as a result of their believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that moment when you first believed? Do you remember the transformation that took place and the continual transformation that God does in us each and every day of our lives as we continue to walk with him? I'll never forget it. Because up until that point, all I had was a religious experience. All I did was pray a little prayer when I was eight years old and got up and nothing changed and nothing happened. And I remember I was invited to a, an altar at a Christian school to pray. And I remember when I knelt down at that altar and prayed, the Spirit of God came upon me, and I didn't know what was happening to me. And I began to weep and weep, and the Spirit of God began to soften my heart and move in my life. And there was like scales that began to just fall off my eyes, I began to see things that I'd never seen before, being able to realize things that I'd never realized before. That Friday night, I was at a football game. At halftime in the end zone at a football game, the Spirit of God came upon me again. I began to weep, and it was at that moment that I realized that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. That Sunday morning, I bowed my heart and my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and myself or my life has never been the same. I haven't been perfect. There have been times where I've fallen flat on my face, but I was never the same after having believed. These were 3,000 people that believed. Number two, they belonged. They belonged. Those who believed, those 3,000, those who believed what Peter said were baptized, and they were added to the church that day, about 3,000 and all. Well, baptism is important. If you have never been water baptized, baptized after having believed, you need to be baptized. I baptize, I baptize people in fountains, ponds, horse troughs, you name it, baptistries. They believed, they were baptized, and listen to this, verse 41 says, and then they were added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. They were, after they believed, they belonged. After they believed, they were added to the church. When you believe, you don't have to go out and do life alone. God did not create you and I to do life alone. He created us to do life with other people. And we save us when we believe. He gives us a place called the local church, the family of God, a place to belong so that our faith can be nourished that our faith can be encouraged, that our faith can be stretched so that we can love each other and share with each other and help provide for each other. If you're here today and you've believed and you don't have a place to belong, this might be the place for you. You have a place to belong here. Listen, everybody has a longing. It's a God-given deal inside of them. Everybody has a longing for belonging. Everybody longs to belong to something to someone, to some, somewhere, because God Almighty placed that instinctively by his spirit in us. That's why you see people going out and joining gangs. Why? Because they just long to belong and be loved and be accepted by someone. That's why the Bible says that he gives the orphan and widow a family. Everybody has a longing to belong. What's amazing is these people that believe, these 3,000 and all that believe, they were added 
to the church. When, when we're born, we're, we're born sinners. When we're born again, we're born again into the family of God, the universal church, past, present, and future. But also God expects us to be a part of a local body, a community of faith, the family of God. He added them to the church that day. And what's interesting is their faith in Christ is what unified them and brought them together. 3,000 different personalities, 3,000 different backgrounds, 3,000 different people that came from different parts of the earth. You think about all the different things that divides people today. You think about all the different things going on in our country today that's dividing people. But I want to tell you something this morning. Listen, it doesn't matter what color you are, if you're black or white or Hispanic, red, purple or yellow, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, male or female, it doesn't matter where you came from. If you've believe the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been born again that makes you and I brothers and sisters in Christ we're family we're family no matter we look different talk different act different got different backgrounds we're family and that's what unified the early church and that's what must unify us as a church today allow nothing to come between the unity of the body of Christ 3,000 they believed and they were added to the church that day. They had a place to belong. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8, it says this. It says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We're many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. Turn to your neighbor and say, you belong to me. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I belong to you. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Listen, do you understand this morning that God has given you a gift or gifts for doing something well? Don't tell me that you're not gifted. Don't tell me now that you're to too old and that you have nothing else to give the body of Christ. That is a lie. God has given you a gift or gifts to do certain things well. And there's people in this church, in the body of Christ, that needs the gift that you have. God didn't give you that gift to look good. God didn't give you that gift to put all the attention on you. God surely didn't give you that gift to just sit there and let it grow stagnant in your chair. God gave you that gift because somebody else in the body body of Christ needs what you have. God's given different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God's given you. God's not going to reach down, open your mouth and make you prophesy. You have to put your faith in action. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage other, be encouraging. Somebody or somebody has the gift of encouragement at the assembly of West Monroe, and I can assure you that there are plenty of people sitting amongst us today that need some encouragement. So if you have the gift of encouragement, get to giving your gift away to those that need encouraging. Write them a letter, send them an email, send them a text, call, take them to coffee, but use your gift. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. Listen to this now. And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Verse 18, but our bodies have many parts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Listen, in fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest 
care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. Listen, there's some of you in here, you're serving behind the scenes. You're praying where nobody else can see you pray. You're serving where nobody else can see if you serve. You're encouraging when nobody else can see you encourage. And you think less of yourself or down on yourself because you can't play the keyboard, the drums, the guitar, or preach. But I can assure you, God Almighty sees every gift that he's given you. He sees every gift that you're using behind the scenes to serve his church for his glory. Don't stop doing it. Look, it says, this makes for harmony among the members so that all the members can care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Look, being a part of the church, being a part of the local body of believers, the community of faith, two things. Number one, it allows you to be loved and cared for. And number two, it allows you to love and care for other people. See, it works both ways. It's not all about you. Sometimes people get mad and they didn't, nobody said hi and I didn't get a call or this, that, and the other. You're not just here for you. You're here for somebody else as well. Now, you're here to be loved and cared for. And, and when you suffer, we all suffer. When you're honored, we, 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 we all honor or all honor. We all rejoice with you. But it's a twofold thing. We got to get out of this consumer mentality where it's all about me, myself, and I. What can the church do for me? No, it's what can I do for the church? How can I serve the church? What can I do to bring glory to God? What can I do to, to strengthen and grow his church? I want to be a part of that church. Number three. They became. They became. It says all the believers, they, after they believed, after they were added to the church, verse 42, it says all the believers, say all. Because this is the part, the first three words that we, we skip over. And we get to the things that they were devoted to instead of focusing on the fact that they were actually devoting themselves says all the believers. Remember how many believers were saved? How many? 3,000. So all the believers, 3,000, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Let's focus on these first three words. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. I'm going to repeat this until it gets in your, in your heart. They devoted themselves. They devote, who were the they? The 3,000. They weren't talking about the apostles per se. They weren't talking about leadership. They were talking from grassroots up. The 3,000s that were born again and saved and added to the church. They, the 3,000, they devoted themselves. Look, we have to stop expecting other people to do what God expects us to do ourselves. They devoted themselves. I can't be devoted for you. I can't be compassionate for you. I can't be bold for you. I can't serve for you. That's something that you have to devote yourself to. And until we as the church begin to devote ourselves to the things that really matter, those ingredients in the early church that really were vital in, in making that church a, a vibrant, healthy community that literally exploded to change the world, we're just going to be stagnant. We'll just be have this consumer mentality where we come in, get fed by the preacher, and go out and continue to do our own things. We have to realize that when we believed and when we were added to the church and had a place to belong, we have a responsibility to become, a responsibility to devote ourselves. Look, when you're devoted, when you're... When you're, when you're committed, when you're dedicated, you don't have to have somebody to remind you of things uh, if you're devoted and dedicated to them already. What I mean by that is I'm devoted to deer hunting. My wife never has to remind me ever when it's coming up every year. It's October 1st. I, why is that? Because I devoted myself to that. See, you don't have to be reminded of things when you yourself are devoted to those things when your heart is turned to those things 
the early church believers, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Look, have you devoted yourself to the word of God? I can't read the word for you. I can't have a devotion for you. You have to be self-devoted. You have to be devoted yourself to spend time in the word of God each and every day. It says they devoted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship is important because it gives us the opportunity to build relationships. And out of relationships comes to discipleship. And that's the goal because Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey everything. Look, you can't make a disciple if you don't have relationships with them. And it's near impossible to build a relationship with somebody if you don't ever fellowship with them. That's why it's important that we have opportunities as a church to fellowship, to come early, grab some coffee, whatnot, before Wednesday night or Sunday. Why? Because it gives you the opportunity to fellowship with other people that you've never met. And when you fellowship with them, you might just build a relationship with them. And when you build a relationship with them, discipleship occurs. And you enter into the becoming together, where you're becoming like Christ together, where you're doing life together. You're doing more than just showing up and sitting by each other on a Sunday morning. You're calling each other during the week. You're texting each other during the week. You're holding them accountable in their marriage or time with their kids. You're holding them accountable in their prayer life. And what they're viewing on the internet or TV, they devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, to meals, including the Lord's Supper. They devoted themselves to prayer. Have you devoted yourselves to prayer? Have you dedicated and committed yourself to time alone with God in prayer? It amazes me that we could think that we could ever outdo or become more more than the church was in Acts chapter 2 by doing any less than what they did in this chapter that we read. If we want to see the church grow inwardly and thrive and and, and grow healthy as disciples of Christ, and as a result of that, we grow and and we reach the community, we reach out, then it it will cause all of us as believers here at the assembly to devote ourselves When someone's devoted, you don't have to remind them to pray. You don't have to remind them to tithe. You don't have to remind them to give. You don't have to remind them to reach out to the lost and the hurting and the broken. Why? Because they're devoting themselves to those things. We got to start devoting ourselves to things that matter and stop getting distracted by the things that don't matter. They devoted themselves. I want to be a church like that. I want the assembly to be a church where we care about each other. Here as a body, as a family, where we fellowship together, where we pray together, where we read scripture together, enjoy relationship with each other, where we do life together, where we share our resources with each other, where we give generously. And when one part of the body rejoices, we all rejoice. When one part mourns, we all mourn. I want God's favor and God's blessing upon this place. I want to see the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit poured out, moving in us and through us and amongst us. I want to see God's miraculous power saving the lost, healing the sick, and freeing people from demonic spirits. What about you, church? This was a healthy, thriving church because they devoted themselves. But look, a healthy body isn't one that's just healthy on the inside, but it also is truly healthy on the outside. You can look healthy on the outside, but be eaten up with cancer and disease on the inside. The church is a body. I want to be a a body, a church where we're healthy on the inside so that way we can reach out to those on the outside where this community is healthy so we can reach out to that community outside these four walls that need Jesus. Look, there are two major bodies of water dominating where the land where Jesus ministered, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee, and they'll put a picture up, is in the northern part of Israel, and it is truly a scene of beauty. My wife and I went and spent some time there in the summer of 2017. We were able to take a boat ride and worship the Lord on the Sea of Galilee. It was absolutely a beautiful, beautiful place. 
The Sea of Galilee, it's headwater, it's fed by the headwaters of the Jordan River. It has an inlet where it receives life, and it has an outlet where it gives away life. Listen, there's another place we visited called the Dead Sea. There's a picture there as well in the southern part of Israel. Now, my wife told me before she stepped out this morning, don't, don't you put up that picture again, but she's not here right now, so I did it anyway. She said, you're trying to make a serious part, and everybody's laughing. So the, the salt content is so high in the Dead Sea, things can float, including bodies of people. We just relax, and you literally float to the top. We're laughing. I'm reading the magazine. Everybody's floating in the Dead Sea. Look, the Dead Sea receives an average of 6 million tons of water every day from the Jordan River. The water has collected mineral substances from the soil of the area. Because of all these substances that they collect, unlike its counterpart, unlike the Sea of Galilee, it has an inlet, but not an outlet. Listen, as a result of that, there is no life. There is no life that can take place in the Dead Sea. Listen, church, if we want to keep ourselves from becoming stagnant, if we want to keep ourselves from not becoming the Dead Sea, but a dead church, we have to have an inlet of life, but we can't keep it amongst ourselves. There has to be an outlet of life that is poured out in us, through us, in the community in which we live. Why is that, you say? Because, look, the greatest need and the only hope for humanity is the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God saving everyone who believes. The Jew first, then the Gentile. This gospel shows how people can be made right with God, and it happens from start to finish by faith. The gospel or the good news, it is the power of God saving everybody that will believe. Don't tell me you're too far lost or too far gone for the power of the gospel to transform your life. You're not too far lost. You're not too far gone. You're not too far backslidden. You're not too addicted. The gospel of Jesus Christ will save anybody and everybody that's daring to believe. Look, God never intended for us to keep that to ourselves. Your relationship with Jesus may be personal, but it is not private. We'll say that again. Your relationship, my relationship with Jesus, it's a personal relationship, but it's not private. In other words, my relationship with Jesus, what he's done in my life, the power of the gospel that transformed me, that saved me, is too good for me and it's too good for you to keep to ourselves. There are people that we come in contact with every day of our lives whose souls and spirits are crying out for the gospel of Jesus Christ to save them, to transform them, to make them a new person, give them a new life, give them hope, and change their eternal destiny forever. And we have the answer to the world's greatest problems. Not any political system, not the White House, not any other house. The hope of the world, the answer to humanity is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have that answer, church. Who does the reaching out and who is reached? Pastor Chad, you can go ahead and come out. Listen to me. We, as, we those, we, those who have believed, those who have been, those have who have been added to the church, those who are becoming, because you understand our becoming is a process. We're regenerated, we're changed, we're transformed, but becoming like Christ is a lifelong process. Has, has anybody arrived yet? No, we're all becoming, and we're going to continue to become daily more like Christ until the, until the day and until the time he comes to take us. Look, the, the fact that we're fully devoted as these Early church believers, they were they devoted themselves. Just because we're fully devoted doesn't mean we're fully developed. There's still a lot of developing that needs to take place in my life. There's still a lot of developing that needs to take place amongst us. But I do understand this. Those three, th that church, there were 3,000 people whose lives were radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they became world changers. 
and they started this grassroots movement. It was more than the birth of the early church. It was this radical movement called the way that was ignited. So much happened through the 3,000 that were saved that day. And we have to understand, church, that it doesn't fall on a pastor or a group of pastors or, or a staff or a board alone. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We all have to see ourselves as having a responsibility a responsibility that we're devoted to, a cause that we're devoted for. We're responsible as individuals, as families, and as the community of faith to reach the lost, to reach the broken, to reach the forgotten, to reach the poor. So as an individual believer, I have that responsibility to reach out. You have a responsibility to, to reach out in your world so that your world can be changed through Christ. You have a responsibility at your job to reach out. As business owners, you have a responsibility to use your company to reach people. We have responsibilities as families to reach people, to open our homes, to be hospitable, to serve other people. As a church, we must, as a body, do so well as a church uh, where each and every individual sees their responsibility to reach out. I want to be that church. When my daughter, oldest daughter, was, was growing up, she, she asked me all kind of good theological questions. Some I could answer, some I couldn't. She'd keep me on my toes. There was one day she said, Daddy, does, does God have hands? I began to think about that, and I said, Baby, as a matter of fact, he does. He does have hands. And, baby, those hands are visible. You, you, if you open your eyes and look around, you can, actually, you can actually see the hands of God. Because the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. The, the church is the physical representation of Jesus Christ on this earth. So when we as believers, when we're devoting ourselves, when we're reaching out to the lost and to the hurting and, and to the poor, when we're reaching out with our hands and with our lives and, and with our families, people are actually able to see the very hands of God reaching out. And that's what this community needs, and that's what we as a church are called to do.